Darkness is not an affirmative force. It simply reoccupies the space vacated by the light. This is the Hamilton Quarter on American Family Radio. It should be uncomfortable for a believer to live as a hypocrite. Delivering people out of the bondage of mainstream media. And the philosophies of this world. God has called you and me to be his ambassadors. Even in this dark moment. Let's not miss our moment. And now, the Hamilton Corner. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Hamilton Corner here on American Family Radio. My name is Abraham Hamilton III. J. Mack is manning the controls this evening, and we're ready to rock and roll with today's edition of the program. I want to welcome every single one of you to the show. However you are listening, however you are watching, however you are tuning in, wherever you are doing that, I want to tell you that I appreciate you. Our whole team appreciates you. There would be no program if it were not for our listeners and supporters. And so in this time, in this era, where you have content everywhere, all kinds of programs you could tune in to, I'm grateful that you made the decision to tune in here. At this very moment, many of you, if not most of you, are making your transition from your part-time jobs where you generate an income to your full-time jobs where you cultivate an outcome. Here we endeavor to communicate it in this fashion because the world works overtime to make us think and to believe we even use the terminology that what we do to generate revenue is our full-time gigs, our full-time jobs. Uh, But that is not who we are on a full-time basis. That is a part of what we do. Uh, But what we do is not synonymous with who we are in that regard. Uh, Our full-time commitment, if you are a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, is to cultivate an outcome via the execution of our Lord's commission. And as I say always, I want to remind you that it is the Lord's desire for what we do ministerially, you know, what we do in external opportunities to minister. It is his desire that it is the overflow of what we enjoy personally in relationship with him. As I say it all the time, When Jesus was questioned about the great commandment, he responded with two replies. The first is you shall love the Lord with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and your strength. And the second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The first component is this vertical orientation. That we are to love the Lord with all that we are. You know, and and as we have the privilege of walking with him in relationship and, and seeing various aspects of the character of, of, of God Almighty, it, it provokes a vibrancy in relationship that then has a second component, that it overflows into our horizontal engagements. So it is the vertical orientation that is first and foremost at all times. The sad reality is that we have some people who are persuaded of their need of Messiah. They're persuaded of the necessity of having uh, their sins forgiven But then we boil over or move over into this realm of attempting uh, to pour out of an empty vessel, so to speak, distribute it to others what we have not partaken of personally. And that only lasts so long. That that actually is how we get to the place where people are burned out, to where we're, we're endeavoring to disseminate something that we're not currently feasting on. But it is is the Lord's desire that our thriving in personal intimacy, our thriving in personal relationship and communion with him is what governs, is what guides, is what drives our external uh, evidences of, not evidences, but instances of ministry. So as you're transitioning from your part-time jobs to your full-time jobs, The first order of business is making sure your personal relationships with the Lord are cultivated continuously. You know, does your heart burn uh, for the presence of the Lord today? You know, how does it impact you when you consider uh, the reality of our Lord's salvation, the Lord's sacrifice? And I'm not just talking about at an emotional point. I'm talking about a deliberate, deliberate, uh, intentional investment in meditating on the person and work of Jesus Christ. You know, you study the writings of the Apostle Paul, you find he never graduated from being awed by the fact that the Lord would save him. 
And it is when that is properly positioned that the attendant component of cultivating outcomes is met more readily. This is what the Lord desires of us. And so then when we step back and recognize that the first institution that God created was a family with marriage at the center of it. And the Lord established the family as his primary vehicle for multi-generational witness to propagate gospel fidelity, to propagate Christ following from generation to generation to generation. You begin to realize that what happens in your home is far more important than what happens in the White House. And, you know, I say it a lot because it's true. It doesn't diminish or to demean what happens in the White House. Sure, things that happen within our government, they're important, but they should not eclipse, they should not supplant, they should not supersede what goes on in our homes. And if we, um, as I was talking a couple weeks ago with Jordan Shambly, uh, because we're in Christ, man, there's nothing that is mundane, nothing that is common. Uh, we, we, have the particip- the ha- the particip- we have the privilege of being a part of God's holy people. And because of his presence in what we do, he makes all things holy. With that, let's turn to the word of God. We're actually going to spend some time <clears throat> here today. And I want to take my time walking uh, through this scripture because, uh, as, as my brother and I, local church, Brother Stone says all the time, you take the text out of its context, you're left with a con. That's the truth. That's the truth. And, and unfortunately, just scriptural passage are ripped out of their context that leads to the opposite of rightly dividing the words of truth to where great violence is perpetrated upon the scripture because we end up communicating something that is foreign to the mind and heart of God and then using his word as a uh, supporting source for that misunderstanding, misappropriation, and miscommunication ultimately. But Jeremiah chapter 29, verses 1 through 13. Most people are familiar with verse 11, but most people are not familiar with the context of verse 11, which are included, which is included in verses 1 through 13, which is a portion of the entire work of Jeremiah, who is a prophet whom the Lord sent to minister to the southern kingdom of, of Judah prior to Babylonian exile. Jeremiah pled and appealed with the Jewish people prior to Babylonian exile. This is why he's commonly described as a weeping prophet, because not many people listen to Jeremiah. (laughs) We have people that, yeah, I want to be this, I want to be that. Um, Not many people listen to Jeremiah. He wept and lamented because people failed to heed his prophetic warnings. And the Lord even ministered through Jeremiah to prepare the people of Judah for what was to come during their exile into Babylonian captivity and what would transpire thereafter. Much of this or some of this is communicated to us in verses 1 through 13 in the 29th chapter, 29th chapter of Jeremiah's book. <clears throat> All right, I'm going to re- read it here. And I'm going to take my time because we're going to spend some time in this, in this chapter today for the program. All right, Jeremiah 29, verse 1. These are the words of the letter that Jeremiah the prophet sent from Jerusalem to the surviving elders of the exiles and to the priests, the prophets, and all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had taken into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. This was after King Jeconia and the queen mother, the eunuchs, the officials of Judah and Jerusalem, the craftsmen, and the metal workers had departed from Jerusalem. The letter was sent by the hand of Elasa, the son of Shaphan, and Gamaria, the son of Hilkiah, whom Zedekiah, king of Judah, sent to Babylon to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. It said, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat their produce. Take wives and have sons and daughters. Take take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there. 
do not decrease, but seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on his behalf. For in its welfare, you will find your welfare. Or Some translations where welfare is used here, uh, the word peace, but seek the peace of the city where I've sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf or in its peace, you will find your peace. All right. Verse eight, for thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, do not let your prophets and your diviners who are among you and who are among you deceive you and do not listen to the dreams that they dream for it is a lie that they are prophesying to you in my name. I did not send them declares the Lord. For thus says the Lord, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you and I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. That's Jeremiah chapter 29, verses 1 through 13. Now, I want to, again, take my time walking through this because people quote verse 11 from Jeremiah 29 frequently. But how often do people refer to the context that verse 11 appears in? So verse 1, the Word of God says, These are the words of the letter that Jeremiah the prophet sent from Jerusalem to the surviving elders of the exiles and to the priests, the prophets, and all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had taken into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. The first thing I want you to note is that these are prophetic words that Jeremiah put into a letter. All right? Jeremiah put this into a letter. He is in Jerusalem, and he's sending this in a letter to, as he describes it, to the, the surviving exiles, the surviving elders of the exiles. And to the priests, and to the prophets, and to all the peoples. This is a letter that Jeremiah is sending from Jerusalem to Jews who are already in Babylon. They're already in Babylon. The second verse tells us this was after King Jeconia, King Jeconia and the Queen Mother, the eunuchs, the officials of Judah and Jerusalem, the craftsmen and the metal workers had departed from Jerusalem. This verse gives us an historical time period as a point of reference. All right. This is... <laughs> The Lord, by his sovereign grace, allowing us to put a time stamp on when Jeremiah has this letter, sends this letter to the Jewish exiles in Babylon. King Jeconia is actually King Jehoiachin, who is referred to in 2 Kings chapter 24, verses 8 through 20. All right. King Jehoiachin's mother, mother's name was Nehushta which is why she's described here as the queen mother. All right? So we, we have this, this time stamp that once again confirms and affirms the fact that these are real people chronicling real events that happen at a real point in time in human history. This is one of the, one of the, the points in time where I use this to demonstrate how world history should be taught within the context of biblical history that we can place real events that the scripture records within the overarching time or overarching unfolding of human history because there was a reality of a babylonian empire that was a global superpower global superpower that preceded the mede medes Empire, then the Medo Persian Empire, then the Persian Empire, then the Greeks, then the Romans, so on and so forth. It's amazing how world history seems to comport directly with Scripture. More, Jeremiah 29, verses 1 to 13, when we get back from the break. 
Some guy who claims to be a girl is not science. I'm sorry. You no, did, it's not. You just can't claim to be something that you're not. No, we don't allow people to choose their ethnicity. No. Or their age. No, I can't say I'm, you know, I'm an Eskimo, so provide me with a free igloo. We yeah. don't let people do that. We don't. You're a male, and you can't claim to be a female, because you're not. Today's Issues, weekday mornings at 11 Eastern and 10 Central on American Family Radio. Little did you know that the same legal terminology, the same legal terms that we use today, uh, probable cause, just cause, there's multiple ways to describe it, but David uses that same terminology. How do we know what's just? Well, we know what's just by looking at God's Word. That's where we get our ultimate definition of justice from. AFA at the Core with Walker Wildman. Weekday afternoons at 1 Central on American Family Radio. My wife, Jan, played in the marching band in high school and then in college. They all had matching uniforms, but when they played the music, nobody played exactly the same thing. As believers, unity of the faith, we're not the same. Uh, We're different. We have different parts to play, Mm. but there can be unity as we play our part in Christ Jesus. Exploring the Word, weekday afternoons at 3 Central on American Family Radio. Shining light into the darkness, this is the Hamilton Corner on American Family Radio. Welcome back. Abraham Hamilton III here on the Hamilton Corner. We're just walking through Jeremiah 29 today, verses 1 through 13. And and I think this is important because in in the midst of all of the events that are unfolding and that are swirling around us, it's very easy to be consumed in all of these events. But the Lord has given us his word as an anchor for us, an anchor for our souls, frankly. And I think it's, it's, it's important and appropriate for us right now to, to step back a little bit and peer into the Lord's word and allow the Lord's word to give us clarity as to where we are. And it enables us to have greater uh, clarity in interpreting and navigating the events that are around us. Now, before we went to the break, we'd only gotten to the second verse in Jeremiah chapter 29. That gives us a timestamp to the letter that is recorded for us in chapter 29, verses 1 uh, through, actually, it goes all the way to verse 25. I'm sorry, 23. Uh, but I'm just taking a portion of this letter and navigating it and attempting to give the, the appropriate context that, that enables us to understand what the Lord is revealing of himself as he was giving instruction and guidance to the people of Israel, people of Judah specifically, who had been exiled into Babylon. So verse 2 in Jeremiah 29 lets us know that the letter is sent at the time that King Jeconia or King Jehoiachin, these are names with different derivatives based on the linguistic, linguistic emphasis being employed. But King Jehoiachin was the son of Jehoiakim. All right. Jehoiakim was paying tribute to Nebuchadnezzar and laying low. But then... Jehoiakim, this is one of the events that precipitated Babylon coming in, Nebuchadnezzar coming with his full wrath. But as you're going to see, uh, though Neb thought he was flexing, the Lord was using Babylon as his belt, if you will, to apply the discipline and judgment to the, to the nation of Judah. But Jehoiakim was operating, you know, kind of in a subservient fashion, fashion, paying tribute to Nebuchadnezzar and laying low. But then all of a sudden he was like, man, hold up, man. I'm tired of paying this dude. (laughs) And so uh, he finally led the nation of Judah in rebellion against Nebuchadnezzar, which he decided, I'm tired of running Debo my coin. (laughs) But what he didn't realize is that the Lord would use Nebuchadnezzar as the instrument of his judgment against the kingdom of Judah. And so when he, Jehoiakim, led Judah in rebellion against Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar Nebuchadnezzar came to crush that rebellion. And King Jehoiachin, son of Jehoiakim, was only on the throne for, for about three months when he had to face 
the most powerful army in the world at the time, the Babylonian army. Nebuchadnezzar defeated Judah. All of this is in 2 Kings chapter 24. Nebuchadnezzar de defeated Judah and carried away exiles from Judah into Babylon as spoils of war. All right. All of this transpired in about 597 B.C. All right. Now, people misunderstand it wasn't like a blitzkrieg type of war. It really was a, a siege and a war of attrition to where initially Nebuchadnezzar laid siege against Israel, against Judah, starting dating back to 605 B.C., where we have the book of Daniel. You know, Daniel and his friends, Azariah, Hananiah, and Mishael are noted as being among the first of the exiles into Babylon. So you already had Jews in Babylon when, when Jeremiah writes his letter, all right, which is why he addresses it to the exiles who are in Babylon. All right. Then we get to verse 3. It says, The letter was sent by the hand of Elasa, the son of Shaphan and Gamariah, the son of Hilkiah, whom Zedekiah, king of Judah, sent to Babylon to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. By the time Zedekiah appears, he's kind of like a vassal to Babylon. All right? And so Nebuchadnezzar uses two men who are messengers, Elasa and Gamariah. They carry this letter to Babylon pursuant to the Lord's direction. Again, reaffirming the fact that this is a letter. Now, verse 4 is where I want to spend a little bit of time. Well, just not a, not a whole lot of time, but to make an observation. Verse 4 says this, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. See, Nebuchadnezzar misinterpreted his dominance, and that is evident later on in the book, in the book of Daniel. He thought that his prominence and dominance on the global stage at the time was due solely to himself. <laughs> but the Lord reveals very plainly, very directly, very clearly through Jeremiah that he reveals is, is it, it is the Lord who has sent the Jews into exile. It is the Lord who has judged the southern kingdom of Judah and sent them into exile and allowed Nebuchadnezzar to consume them. Now, the reason why I want to focus on this is to emphasize and to underscore the fact that the scripture shows that it was God is the one who used Babylon as an instrument of his judgment. There are some who would say, sure, God would judge Judah, but then become quizzically ignorant as to whether or not, yeah, God would judge Judah, but y'all want to know something else? God would judge the USA. Mm hmm God will judge the USA. I'll be even more specific. God has and is judging the USA. Now here, I'm going to demonstrate this from Scripture. The judgment against Judah was a stern one. It was a, it was a harsh judgment. But it was not a demonstration of God's cataclysmic wrath. It was a warning judgment promulgated to provoke repentance on the part of the people of Judah. It was a judgment that was employed in an effort to capture their attention, to get them to become um, willingly investigative of the heart condition of themselves individually and of themselves as of the entire nation. You go back to Jeremiah chapter 17, when the Lord sent Jeremiah to the potter's house, the potter's working at a vessel. Then as he's working it, the vessel spoils, the Bible says, in his hands. And the Lord says to Jeremiah, can I, God, not do with my people Judah what this potter has done with the clay in his hands 
Am I not the potter for the nation of Judah? And are not my people the clay? Then he ultimately says, he makes an observation about the capacity, capacity of the nation to return to him. Then he says, let every man be made aware of the plague of his own heart. The Lord's ultimate objective was to get the people of Judah for in each individual Jewish person in Babylon to be getting to examine the plague of his own heart, the plague of her own heart. And the conclusion of that will result in a culmination in the nation coming to a collective realization that the scripture is going to reveal in a moment. You've heard me say numerous times in this program, I, I am fully persuaded that the United States of America is the greatest nation in the history of the known world, in the history of the world. I also say that America is not heaven. And in a nation that is a constitutional republic with democratic features where we have the opportunity to elect our own leaders, to select those who will be our servant leaders, what we have witnessed, if we are honest about it, is that we have people with the corruption and everything that's happening in the upper echelons of our governmental apparatus and everything, we have people that by and large reflect the corruption that is endemic in the hearts of the American populace. With the people that have the liberty to select their own servant leaders, if there is a consistent, ascending, and persistent wickedness in the hearts of the populace, do you think those people will select leaders, servant leaders, who are righteous in their orientation? In a lot of ways, what is happening in our governmental structures really is a mirror to what's happening in the hearts of of our people. You know. Oh, the Biden's in office. They're, they're selling influence. They're peddling influence. How much of the American citizenry is selling out their commitment to righteousness to make a buck? <laughs> I'm not trying to blame the American people for what's happened with some of the people who are occupying positions of authority. But I am asking us the question to say, how far afield are those people from our people, our citizenry? You can go on and on, down the line, down the line, down the line. In a lot of ways, we have the you know, servant leaders that we have deserved for quite some time. By hook or by crook. Let me continue on with the text. Oh, man, I don't want to run out of time. Ooh, got to move. Verse 4, the Lord reveals that it was him ultimately who was the cause of this judgment. Verse 5, but in judgment, it, this is one of the things that blows my mind about God, man. In judgment, the Lord is now found, after making the observation that he is the one who sent the Jews into exile, he's now found giving counsel and instruction to the Jews as to how they are to navigate exile. Verse 5, build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat their produce. Take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters Multiply there and do not decrease. Though they are exiled as a result of God's judgment, God has given them instructions to not allow the circumstances in which they find themselves to manipulate them away from functioning in a, po in, in a posture where they can increase. The increasing here is population-wise. Don't allow the exile to cause you to diminish. Because you, though you are in exile, though you are laboring in judgment, you are still my people. The very fact that there we have a God that we serve, that as he's applying belt to backside, he's simultaneously say, giving instructions for how you can, can, you can thrive in the midst of the judgment is a revelation of a gracious God. That even in judgment, he's given them guidance for provision for them as a people. Isn't that amazing? 
just as God did this for the Jews in the current context that we're facing in our nation where we're degrading in all manner of national operation, it is the same God who will give us counsel to say, but if you return to my word, if you return to my purposes. And he even gives specific instruction. Further specific instruction. Verse 7, but seek the peace, but seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf. For in its welfare, you will find your welfare. What? This is God literally instructing the Jews that while you are exiled in judgment, seek the blessing and the benefit of Babylon. See how you can serve in Babylon while you're there. So that the so that the so that the city of Babylon, so that the nation of Babylon prospers. That's how you have a Daniel functioning in government. That's how you have an Azariah, Hananiah, and Mishael serving as provincial leaders. But Abe, they're in Babylon, yes. And the Lord still requires faithfulness to him of them while they're in Babylon, because he is the one, again, who's placed them there. I've encountered many believers who've had this tension. Abe, America is like a modern-day Babylon. This system is so wicked. The nation is so corrupt. Those are factual statements. But let's step back a, a step, a pace further. Did God, did God place you here? Did God place me here? Did God place us here with the mandate of being salt and light? As he told the Jews, seek the welfare of the city where I've sent you. And then he even explains further and pray to the Lord on his behalf for in its welfare, you'll find your welfare. There is provision for you that is connected to the context I planted you in. Similarly, brothers and sisters, we are here now. It's not the Lord's desire for us to, to, oh, I'm out. Yes, it's a dual citizenship. We are citizens of the eternal kingdom. We are, like the Hebrew writer says, searching for a city whose builder and maker is God. And in the here and now, the fact of our eternal reality should inform and guide our temporal and current engagement. Seek the welfare of the city where I've sent you. And pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare you will find your welfare. And in case you're wondering, the beginning of verse 8 says, For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel. This is God's instruction to the Jews in exile. God's instruction is very similar to us in the here and now. It is because of our confidence in the safety and the security that we know that America is not our eternal home. Heaven is our eternal home. And it is because heaven is our eternal home, it guides our engagement and service in America. There's more. On the other side of the break, we'll bring this to a close in this final segment. You're listening to The Hamilton Corner. Stay close. Well, the great, you said this many, many years back. You've been saying this for a long time. You said the Lord has invited us to be fishers of men. Mm -hmm. uh, But then once you catch the fish, you got to clean them. Yeah. You know, it takes time. It takes patience. That's the thing. I think the easier thing would be just to say, well, come to church or say this prayer or whatever it may be. But after that, then what? Airing the Addisons, weekday afternoons at 2 Central on American Family Radio. Some Christians have become desensitized to the simple gospel. While we're busy by waiting on miracles, we're missing out on simply knowing Jesus. When our relationship with Him looks more like a to-do list, we're depriving ourselves of freedom. Let's be more mindful of the presence of God in the mundane. Let's just love Jesus and let Him love us back. To read the full blog, The Simple Gospel by Lauren Bragg, visit afa.net forward slash the stand. afa.net forward slash the stand. Avino Kids has an ad for children's shampoo, targeting children with their LGBTQ agenda. This advertisement's attempt to morally corrupt our children is wrong and must be stopped. We at One Million Moms are petitioning to have Avino cancel the commercial and to stop pushing this immoral agenda on our children once and for all. 
Stand with us to protect them by signing the petition at OneMillionMoms.com. That's OneMillionMoms.com. The Hamilton Quarter Podcast and One Minute Commentaries are available at AFR.net. Back to the Hamilton Quarter on American Family Radio. Welcome back to the Hamilton Corner. Abraham Hamilton III here. We pause at the first portion of verse 8 uh, of Jeremiah chapter 29, verses 1 through 13, before we went to the break. And we only paused because that music was disrespectful because I was I was ready to keep going, but then I heard the music come on. I was like, I guess I got to stop. All right, but in verse 8, the Lord, through the prophet Jeremiah, affirms the fact that this is not merely Jeremiah speaking of his own opinion, but he's conveying the word of God. Verse 8, for thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, do not let your prophets and your diviners who are among you deceive you, and do not listen to the dreams that they dream, for it is a lie they are prophesying to you in my name. I did not send them, declares the Lord. See, the entire thrust of the counsel and the prophetic guidance that God has given to them, giving to the Jews in exile in Babylon through Jeremiah, is directly contradicting what God knew some false prophets were saying in Babylon. So among the exiles, and remember when Jeremiah addressed or, or a list to whom the letter was addressed, he included to the surviving elders of the exiles, surviving elders. Why would he say that? Because there were some elders who died on the trek to Babylon and some, even at this junction, about 597 B.C., going, starting from 605, there's some who had already passed away in Babylon already. All right, surviving elders to the priests and the prophets. You could have put in there false prophets. And to all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had taken to exile into Jerusalem. Now, those were among the addressees because you had people who were purported to be prophets in who were Jewish who purported to be prophets to the people of Judah in Babylon, who were exiled in Babylon, and they were saying things like, this exile is not going to last long. We won't be in Babylon long. And they would say things like, for we are the people of God. You know, remember, you know, we're blessed in the city. <laughs> Fred Hammond's not blessed in the field. We're blessed when we come and when we go. <laughs> and it's because we are the people of God that the Lord shall not allow us to remain subject to the Babylonians much longer. And the Lord is saying to Jeremiah, nah, these cats lying. I ain't send them. <laughs> I did not send them. And he tells them specifically, look, people of Judah who are in Babylon, don't listen to these cats. Don't listen to these false prophets who are among you, these diviners who deceive you. Don't listen to the dreams they dream. They're lying dreams because they're lying. For it is a lie that they're prophesying to you in my name. I did not send them, declares the Lord. Now, why is that important? Some of these people were quoting biblical text. But they were quoting it out of context and misapplying it. It's very similar to a person who will begin quoting Jeremiah, I'm sorry, Deuteronomy 28. And they'll exclude verses 1 and 2 in the chapter. If you hearken diligently into my voice, is what the Lord said. You know, and I, I often make a joke about it. You know, Fred Hammond made the song about being blessed in the city, blessed in the field. But he didn't, he didn't read the beginning. <laughs> the beginning of Deuteronomy, I mean, he, he, didn't, he didn't make a verse out of the beginning of Deuteronomy 28. No shade to Fred. I like the song too, by the way. Well, let me say it this way. No shade to that Fred. Because Fred did some stuff later that needs to be shaded. I mean, he trying to do records with Snoop Dogg. I'm like, what in the world? <laughs> Let me stay focused, Jeff. Verse 1 of Deuteronomy 28 says, And if you faithfully obey the voice of the Lord your God, being careful to do all his command, all his commandments that I command you today, the Lord of God will set you high above all the nations of the earth. And all these blessings shall come upon you, come upon you and overtake you if you obey the voice of the Lord your God. So you had, you had false prophets in Babylon ignoring that part. They completely ignored verse 1, the if you faithfully obey. They skipped that. <laughs> the 
They get to verse 2. They say that part. All these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you. Then they skip the rest of verse 2. The if you obey the voice of the Lord your God part. Mm -mm, didn't read that. Then they pick it up again in verse 3. Then you cue Fred Hammond. You're blessed in the city. We're blessed in the field. Sounds kind of similar today. Well, brother, I just want to tell you, brother, that your best life, God, is for you. It's like, eh, God ain't for everybody. <laughs> In fact, the scripture reveals that not all human beings are children of God. I know people like to say that. And people get very uncomfortable when I when I point them to the scripture. They get tight. I said, read Galatians 3.26. And they read it. For you are all children of God through faith in Jesus Christ. Oh. Yeah. The, the definitive line of demarcation for fellow image bearers of God being transitioned into his eternal family is faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Which means... Fellow image bearers of God who do not have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ are not members of God's eternal family. That's the Bible. That's not my word. That is his word. So getting back to Jeremiah 29, the Lord commissioned Jeremiah to send this letter, move Jeremiah to send this letter because the Jews in Babylon needed to know. Needed to know because when you're down, when you're out, you're a people that have, you have a national pride, but you're being subjugated, you're being oppressed by the Babylonians, you're being mocked by the Babylonians. You know, sing one of those songs of Zion. You have a proclivity to, to listen to people saying, oh, you know, we're, we're, we're coming out of this. The Lord said he'd fight our battles, which he did say to Joshua. And he did give Joshua instructions for how you are to stay in the land. But if you don't obey, the Lord promised the opposite in Deuteronomy 28. Which begins in verse 15. But if you will not obey the voice of the Lord your God or be careful to do all his commandments and obey his statutes that I command you today, then all these curses will come upon you. I don't remember a, a, a jam being made to that. The lying prophets in Babylon wasn't quoting verses 15 down to the rest of the chapter. You see. It's a lie that they're prophesying to you. Then the Lord gets very specific, very specific. In verse 10, the Lord says, for thus says the Lord, when 70 years are completed for Babylon. When 70 years are completed for Babylon. 70 years completed, according to the Babylonian calendar, I will visit you. See, the lion prophets say, nah, man, we're going to get out of here soon. The God of Israel, he's mighty. And he thunders on behalf of his people, you know. The Lord's like, nah, it's going to be 70 years. Seven decades. Get comfy. Get 70 years, almost a century. We know later on that Daniel relied on this prophet from Je prophecy from Jeremiah that helped him to understand what was going to happen while he's in Babylon. And as you've heard me say before, he arrived in Babylon as he led, and he spends the 70 years in Babylon. Daniel spends the majority of his life in Babylon. Yet Babylon is never in him. Man, I love that. Daniel chapter 9, verse 2. He quotes Jeremiah. And he said, I understood from the prophetic writings of Jeremiah that we were going to be here 70 years. He says that explicitly. And so as in light of this instruction that you are going to be here 70 years, Daniel chapter 9, verses 1 and 2 is what, what I was referring to earlier. Where he says, by the, by the books, the number of years specified by the word of the Lord through Jeremiah the prophet, that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. J Daniel relied exactly on what I'm reading to you right now and understanding that they were going to be in Babylon for a long time. But getting back to Jeremiah 29, 10, he says, For thus says the Lord, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you and I will fulfill to you my promise. 
and bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. See, when you quote this verse out of context, you have no understanding as to what really the Lord is attempting to say. It's a very specific promise to a specific people in a specific time. It's not a generalized promise to all people at all times. It's a response, not a response. It is a guide and an instruction for people who are laboring under the judgment of God that, as you see, was not an exhibition of his cataclysmic wrath, but was a judgment to provoke repentance because exercising cataclysmic wrath is like Sodom and Gomorrah. Ain't no more. Here, the Lord is saying, after the belt has been applied to bottom, I'm going to bring you back to me. After 70 years have been completed, and after you, you've been able to evaluate how you got to this place, how your rebellion has caused you to be spewed out from the land that I'd given you as an inheritance, I'll bring you back to this place. There are a lot of people who want to quote the Jeremiah 29 verse 11, but they don't want to quote verses 1 through 10. They don't want to acknowledge that you might be pretty close, closer to the environment and the circumstances and the context that's more 1 through 10-ish than 11-ish. But when you strip it from its context, you miss critical, substantive portions of revelation that we need to know. The entirety of Jeremiah, Jeremiah 29 should be a warning to all of us. We don't want to get to the place where the Lord has to give us guidance in judgment. We want to obey him on the front end. But when the 70 years are completed, the Lord is saying, I'll bring you back because I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for welfare, not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. And then look what the Lord, the Lord makes the observation as to what their response will be. Then you will call on me, call upon me, and come and pray to me, and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. This is the Lord showing that this is a judgment. This is not going to be forever. But I need you to understand what is happening here. So that you properly assess what's going on. This is very similar to the Lord using the prophet Habakkuk saying, I'm, I'm sharing this with you so that when the judgment is applied, that the person who understands that this is a judgment being applied, they'll be able to respond appropriately. He said that to Habakkuk and Habakkuk recorded it saying this, write the vision, make it plain on tablets so that the reader, when he receives this vision, is able to assess what is going on and that he may run. That he may be able to say, hey, you know, Jeff, we may be in exile now, but we're still God's people. He wants us to understand that we're in this condition and in this position because we as a people, we have rebelled against him. But now we need to turn to him in repentance and in faith and fidelity and faithfulness because he also promised to restore us. And so that when he restores us, we don't repeat the errors of our ancestors that led us into this place in the first place. That we don't repeat the errors that we committed in the former condition that led us to this place. That's what the entirety of the context is attempting to communicate. And you have writings like this and the writings of the prophet Ezekiel, the prophet Habakkuk, the prophet Zephaniah and others that, that cumulative, commun cumulatively communicate the reality that even in judgment, a judgment that is, that is promulgated to spur repentance that God makes provision for his people. It is greatly encouraging to know that we serve a God who does that, who is merciful, who is just, who is gracious. And I'm saying all of that, brothers and sisters, here and now, because just as the Lord didn't forget the people of Israel, though it seemed to some of them, and even in Nebuchadnezzar, that man seemed like the Lord has for forgotten his people. He hadn't forgotten his people. He needs his people not to forget him. And if we profess to be the people of God in our context, in our day, most of our listeners are in America, but we have some international listeners as well. The Lord record recorded this for our benefit. Some things in Scripture that the Lord puts there for many things for us to emulate. 
He also places things in scripture for us to observe and to avoid so as not to repeat. And we have the testimony, the witness of God in scripture so that we can glean and understand the Lord as he's revealing himself to us. And it should guide and instruct his character and nature should guide and instruct us as to what we should do in our context and our placement in the here and now, here and now. And my strong encouragement to you is to take the witness of scripture to heart and to see, man, all this stuff that's happening. God is still on the throne today as he was in Nebuchadnezzar's day and in Jeremiah's day. And it's incumbent upon us not to have to suffer a cataclysmic demonstration of God's power to submit ourselves to him in humility, faith, and repentance.